War Thunder can be a cutthroat game at times. It is not like any of the other large multiplayer games. It's no first person shooter like Call of Duty or Valorant, nor some high skill mobile like League of Legends. Not even games like World of Tanks can hold a candle to the realism you'll find once you sell your soul to the stand. Not that you have to. With zero mission fee, you could theoretically grind your all the way from the first model plane that the United States Army Air Force ever had the pleasure of flying, all the way to the United States Air Force's supersonic fighter Vietnam, the F-4 Phantom II. It isn't just a plethora of aircraft that you have at your disposal though. You could hop into a tank and go on a rampage on the ground, or sail the seven seas with naval vessels of varying sizes and classifications. However, I believe that learning how to fly effectively in game is one of the hardest difficulty spikes to overcome. Air realistic battles specifically is arguably the second most difficult game mode to get the grips with, with air simulator battles being the hardest. Here, you work together with several teammates to decrease the enemy's ticket count, the bar found at the top of the screen, down to zero. This can be done in several ways. You can bomb all enemy bases and destroy the enemy airfield, or destroy all enemy ground targets. However, the most common way victory is achieved is through the destruction of the entire enemy team. It is that last objective that this guide hopes to help you with. It is difficult for newcomers to get the grips with the controls and do well right out of the box. I hope to help you through this difficult time, so you too can go from zero to hero in no time. First and foremost, we are going to go with controls. While the default controls for aircraft are fine enough, I would recommend changing them to the control setup that I have at first. Now, I play every now and then. I put some time in the game, you know, every once in a while. However, I believe that my control setup is better than what Gaijin has said for its default when in the heat of the moment. Of course, if you wish to go back to the default controls or change them to something else altogether, it's completely fine. However, setting up controls will eat up too much of my time here. As such, for those who wish to change their controls, in the description is a link to a Google Doc that contains both how to do it as well as what my keybinds are, so that you can change to either what I got or to whatever you wish it to be. The next thing we should cover is aircraft you will fly. Obviously, any good pilot can make a plane shine, but some planes are better than others when it comes to helping an office pilot out. In essence, you want to make sure that your first two aircraft in the game will be able to accommodate for the inevitable mistakes you will make. All nations in the game have a great selection of aircraft for newcomers to try out. Though, admittedly, some are better than others. In fact, there are so many in the game that I've compiled a list full of aircraft that I will recommend for newcomers to try out. That being said, here are a few aircraft that I would recommend trying out. The Bell P-39 Air Cobra is a wonderful plane to fly, with a respectable top speed, decent diving performance, and a bite that can destroy most targets in the form of its heavy machine guns and a 37mm cannon. This flying Cobra has almost anything that you could ever ask for. Just be aware when you get into dogfights. While the P-39 handles mo better than most American planes in these turning engagements, you cannot turn with everything you face, especially if your opponent is a zero. Moral of the story, never turn with them. You'll just die a gruesome death with nothing in return. My next recommendation is the Messerschmitt BF-109. This magnificent beast of German engineering is an aircraft that can do almost anything. It might not be as fast as many of its combatants in both a straight line or a prolonged dive, nor are able to turn with the legs of a zero. Chances are, it has the advantage in a different aspect. It is his ability to fit into most situations, even more so than the aforementioned P-39. That is the reason I would recommend is the 109. Specifically, I would recommend the E variant of the 109 and onwards. Just be careful when using versions of the 109 with the 20mm cannon. You only have a limited supply of 20mm rounds, and when that's all used up, you will be left with only two light machine guns, which have long since outlived their usefulness set against the aircraft in places. Your firepower is primarily found only with the cannons, so be careful in prolonged engagements. Finally, we come to the legendary Supermarine Spitfire, an aircraft that needs no introduction. Making its name in the Battle of Britain and serving throughout the end of the war, this beautiful machine is able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most targets' faces. With a decent top speed and decent offensive armament, this allows you to fight your way out of sticky situations without too much of a hassle. Just be wary of negative G maneuvers with early versions of the Spitfire. Due to a design flaw, fuel will flood into the engine, causing it to temporarily die which will lead to an embarrassing death. That and never dogfight the Zero. That actually goes for most planes, actually. Don't turn with the Zero. Speaking of which...
With the amount of times I've mentioned the Zero, you'd expect that I would recommend it too. And you'd be right. The A6M2 Zero can be considered the Tiger of Japan. Much like how the Allied forces of France mistook most German tanks to be Tigers, pilots in, in the Pacific would often say that they fought a Zero, rather than a different aircraft altogether. Much like all the aircraft found on the list, the Zero is capable of handling itself in those situations. But as mentioned prior, the Zero is one of the best turn fighters in the game, especially in the horizontal axis. Just be wary of its fatal flaws. Much like the Cannon Arm 1 and 9s, the Zero has a low amount of 20mm rounds. So once you're out, you're left with only light machine guns, which require a lot of gun time on target in order to bring anyone down, even more so than those on the 109. Additionally, in order to turn so as well as it can, the Zero had to sacrifice a lot of weight, more than any other America I've mentioned prior. As such, due to the decreased weight, the Zero cannot catch planes in a prolonged dive, not helped by its lackluster top speed. Finally, there's a plane's best known flaw, its lackluster durability. Many planes can shrug off a hit or two and potentially make it back to base. The Zero cannot do this, and is usually shot out of the sky before it can react, which is not good for a newcomer to the game, but that's only if they manage to get shot from target to begin with. With superb handling and turning capabilities, the Zero is also a decent choice for the first fighters you can work towards. One thing of note, with the exception of the BF-109, all of these aircraft are found in rank 2, which means that you'll have to grind through all of rank 1, and some aircraft in rank 2 if applicable, in order to research these recommended fighters. In that case, I recommend doing so in Air Arcade mode. Unlike Realistic mode, Arcade mode does a number of things to make things more friendly for newcomers. First and foremost, for the few matches you will play, you are going to be going up against only bots, which will allow you to get accustomed to flying. In addition, you will also be able to learn how to aim just a little bit due to the assist due to the circle that would appear on screen. From there, it should not take too long before you get your hands on the brand new aircraft of choice, which will allow you to take to the skies and show begin your career. Assuming that you already know how to take off, the first thing you want to do is climb. Of course, you could easily just fly straight and get into a dogfight as soon as you can. But more often than not, all that will do is leave you vulnerable to the vultures circling above. The goal is to be the vulture, not the flying car who's just waiting to be pounced on. At this point, you might be wondering why your altitude correlates to your survival chance, and that has to do with three variables. Speed, energy, and altitude. Or C for short. While this could be a topic in and of itself, Here's a brief explanation about what that is all about. All aircraft require energy to fight, which can be shown by seeing how fast the airplane is going. If you take two planes at two different altitudes and have one dive to the same altitude as the other, the plane with the higher top speed has a higher amount of energy, and therefore has the general advantage in a dogfight. Of course, there are other aspects of dogfighting that can help you, such as turn rate or rate of climb, but above all else, altitude is king. As an example, take the A6M0 from the forward. This is an aircraft infamous for its dogfighting capability, to the point where it's become a common knowledge to never turn with a zero. Yep, when the Japanese used a plane in real life, they usually opted for diving attacks, where you'd have three aircraft working together and make continuous attack runs on their prey below. In fact, this was such a common practice to those who fought the zero that they thought it was a poor turn fighter. There were even pilots on record who said they wanted a zero to turn with them more instead of making their continuous diving attacks. Regardless on how good of a turn fighter your plane is, the most important step to success is to gain altitude. After all, if it worked for the Japanese, it would work for you too. From this point, you're going to want to keep your head on the swivel. You'll need to spot the enemy first before they spot you, because the last thing you want is for someone to strike you while your head is in the clouds. Though this is in reference to tanks, this quote by Nicholas Moran, also known as the Chieftain, is an apt description for why it's important to spot the enemy before they spot you. Okay, so after the war, both the U.S. and the Brit America, U.S. and U.K. militaries did some assessments, be scientific about this. They concluded that the winner of a fight against a Sherman or a Panther was usually whoever fired first, which has a couple of pieces of sense to it. Firstly, you are not going to open a firefight unless you are in a position of advantage to begin with. Secondly, once you do get the first shot off, you are usually calm and collected and the guy on the receiving end is having a significant emotional event. <laughs> so his return shot is likely to be rushed and hurried and will miss anyway while you are adjusting off your first one. No one likes being caught with their pants down, and pilots are no different. If they don't spot you, they are sitting ducks for you to gun down. And even if you miss your first shot, they are most likely panicking while you can loop around without the stress of being jumped yourself. Always check your surroundings every once in a while. 
In this example, there are three planes going after my allied bomber. As they approach, let's play high spy. Will they be able to spot me? A suggestion? Run. Ah! Oh, I'm burning! <laughs> I'm burning! Weren't you supposed to be good at dodging? Oh, have you feel funny? My friend eventually got shot down. He did perform a crucial role in this engagement. He served as a perfect distraction. He managed to distract all three opponents as they tunnel visioned onto him, allowing me to slot right in behind him, shooting them all down with ease. Though it, even I have to say that I'm surprised he did not even notice me as I approached him. Anyways, there are two things to look out for when spotting targets. First thing to look out for is straightforward and self explanatory. When enemies fly into your plane's natural spotting range, they will appear on screen as such. From here, you can determine which course of action to take whether to dive away or challenge them to a fight. However, this will not happen all the time. There will be times when you have to play Where's Waldo with every pixel on screen. The attempt to determine which pixel has murderous intent. It is actually insane to think that every asset can be spotted from virtually any distance, provided the heavy eyes of an elf. This game of hide and seek is the closest you'll ever get to being a pilot of the time, forcing you to use your Mark 1 eyeball to spot targets. Once you have spotted your target, or targets for that matter, there is one thing of note. The person you target matters. Generally, there are two types of targets you want to focus on, and in this order. First, go after the highest targets possible. This prevents them from retaliating after you shut down one of their allies. Next, go after those who are traveling slow. As shown before, since the three targets I was shooting at were moving slow, they were both unable to move out of the way of my guns while serving as easy targets for my fire. In essence, keep your speed and energy up while looking for those who have wasted theirs. Alright, so you spotted your target. Perfectly, the target should be below you, around a um, kilometer or so. Here, you can employ your boom and zoom tactic. This is the safest way to attack someone, and if done properly, it can be employed with most fighters and even some non-fighter planes. In this example, we have a P-51 Mustang currently overhead at BF-109. The first thing you want to do is get a decent position over your target. Preferably, you want to be at a 45 to 70 degree angle to the target, though shallower angles will work too, provided you are traveling relatively quickly. This is so that when you are done with your pass, when you pull up, the target cannot retaliate and get guns on you, due to the speed you accumulated during your initial dive. Once in position, you want to begin said dive. As you dive, keep in mind how your aircraft performs at specific speeds. For instance, if you begin your dive and you are close to your stalling speed, the speed at which your aircraft cannot produce enough lift and will fall from the air, you can leave your engine at full power. However, in most situations, you are going to want to cut your throttle down, anywhere between 30% and 0% will suffice. All you want to do is make sure you don't dive too fast. At certain speeds, your airplane will begin to compress, which is where control surfaces become unresponsive. At these speeds, it will be difficult for you to get guns on target in the best case scenario. In worst case scenario though, your wings will eventually rip off and you will plummet to the ground. As such, it is a good idea to go into a test flight and take your airplane to a high altitude in order to see how your plane performs in a dive, as well as the speed when it rips, so you can make sure that this will happen to you. Now comes the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time to shoot your target. Keep this in mind though. While bullets are fast, they aren't instant. 
has such. You cannot simply put your crosshair on the target and expect the bullets to come at you. If you do this, the bullets will just whiz behind your target as you fly up and escape. Rather, you need to predict where the target will be. You're going to have to lead your shots. While you are still starting off here, you are inevitably going to miss your target most of the time, due to your lack of experience. Do not feel discouraged if you miss. Even experienced players miss their shots every time. As you play the game, your aim is going to continuously improve, but it is something you should keep in mind is this. If you think you are leading enough, lead a little more. In essence, overestimate how much you need to lead in any goal. While on the topic of missing a shot set, let's say that you did miss your shot at the target. Here, you are going to overshoot the target, a situation that allows the victim to retaliate. However, if you have dove on your target properly, as I mentioned before, you will be able to climb out of range of them before they can get shots on you. Just remember to keep an eye on your target as you climb, so you can try and evade their shots if they try to shoot you down. From this point, proceed to loop back onto them. Depending on the location of enemies nearby, you can either return to your original altitude or loop back onto them sooner, around 0.8 kilometers away from them or so. At any rate, you can repeat this cyclical process by making diving passes on your target until they are shot out of the sky. Now. There will inevitably be times when you are on the receiving end of these diving attacks. Here, you are at the mercy of the aggressor. If the enemy pilot has a decent amount of experience and a lot of patience, there's only so much you will be able to do before they inevitably bring you down. However, there are a few things you can do to delay the inevitable. So either you can bring down your would-be assassin, or delay until a teammate can come in and help. The best defense is your eyes. If you spot an attacking coming, you are already 50% of the way out of getting out of the sticky situation. By spotting them early, you will be able to prepare yourself for their attack, rather than panicking at the last moment. As shown from Nicholas Moran's quote, you want to be calm and collected, rather than suffering from a significant emotional event. <laughs> Once you have spotted the hostile target, there are two things you can do. If you spot them early enough, you can dive away to fight another day. Just know that you will probably have to deal with them later on in the match, but at least you're out of harm's way initially. However, if you're too close to them, around 2 to 2.5 kilometers away, and it is evident that they'll be able to catch you if you try to run, you're going to want to slowly work your way to orienting your plane to a perpendicular position to them. If you do it too soon, you'll waste too much speed, making it easier for your opponent to shoot you down. However, once you're around 1.2 kilometers or so, this is when you can want to turn hard towards them in a horizontal axis either to the left or right, depending on which position your plane is oriented compared to the aggressor. If you do nothing, or even try to dive away, you are essentially giving up your life to them. By turning towards them, you will decrease the time that they have to get shots on target, making your chances of surviving the attack with them better by the second. That is not all we can do though. At the last moment, around 0.6 kilometers away from them, so, we're your plane and pull either up or down. By doing this, we are changing our orientation in multiple directions, making it even more difficult for them to get shots on you. In addition, by looping either up and down, we could potentially get into a position where we can make a retaliatory shot of our own. Depending on how the aggressor pulls from their dive, the difficulty of the shot you will have to make will vary, but every now and then, you will be able to nail those retaliation shots. I should mention that while you are on the defensive, you are going to want to hold on to the C key and use your mouse to look at the opponent while you maneuver with the WAST keys, Q, E, F and R keys, as necessary of course. This is why I prefer my control setup. It allows me to maneuver my plane with one hand while controlling my camera with the other. Of course, there will be situations when diving away or turning into the enemy it just won't cut. There will be times when you gotta get down and dirty. Here, while the capability of the planes evolve can skill fight in either direction, in most situations, it is a pilot's skill map. Skills such as throttle control and the usage of flaps will come to you as you play the game, but for now, you're going to know how your plane might be. Essentially, you want to know how your plane flies. Much like how you test drive a car, you want to take your plane into a test flight and see how your plane feels to fly. In order to see how a plane feels, there are a few things you want to think about. First and foremost, you want to take your plane at different speeds and see how the plane turns. Aircraft have an optimal range for where they can maneuver effectively. For instance, Let's just take a look at the P-51 Musk, this legendary thoroughbred of the sky is built this way. With that in mind, it goes without saying that the plane performs well at relatively high speeds, at least in comparison to its competition. You're going to want to keep your speed above 400 km per hour for optimal maneuverability. At these speeds, you can even outturn aircraft who turn better than you initially, 
but as you slip, your opponents inch ever so closer to taking you down. In addition to maneuverability, you also want to know about specific details of your plane. For instance, as I mentioned earlier, the early war Spitfires had an issue where we took the car with you. If you pull any negative Gs, where your screen turns red while you pitch the nose of your plane down, the engine will die. This is due to fuel flooding into the engine, temporarily killing it off in the process. Later models of Spitfire slowly begin to patch the problem, but there is no such solution found with the Mark 1A and both Mark II Spitfires. So be wary when making negative G maneuvers. However, as I mentioned before, knowing your aircraft inside and out is only half the battle. In this example, I got ambushed by a Tempest, who landed a few shots on me. I'm in no immediate danger, but he is not on my tail. From here, there's nothing left I can do but let skill be the cause and hope for the best. Overall, while pilot skill is just something that's going to improve over time, by knowing how your plane performs under most conditions, you are setting yourself up for success, so that by the time your skill at does catch up, you will be able to capitalize on the strengths of your plane even more, allowing you to come out of furballs you won't stop for certain death traps. Eventually, the props of World War II got replaced with plane-feeding jet engines, and with this effect, altitude became less relevant. Jet planes are able to climb without much trouble especially once afterburners became a commonplace on jet fighters. Then, once missiles became more prevalent, dogfighting as a whole became less common. Of course, the missiles used in Vietnam were not particularly reliable, but as their reliability increased, the name of the game became a game of who got the missile off first, rather than who could get on the tail of the hook. That being said, even today, there might be a time when you must call upon the maneuvers from the times of chasing tails to get yourself out of a sticky situation. There is a long list of things you have to worry about when it comes to aerial combat. Even if we just ignore stuff related to the aircraft itself, you have to worry about your surroundings in a three-dimensional space while managing both your speed and altitude, as well as that of your opponents in order to have a chance of coming out victorious. However, there is one final tip that I have for you that will help you succeed. Keep playing the game. Much like in real life, as you accumulate flight hours, your skill will slowly improve. Of course, unlike most games, you might need to put in days, if not weeks or months into the game in order to get good. I wouldn't hold it against you if you were to quit somewhere along the way, but War Thunder has plenty to offer. If you get tired of being shot down for the 17th time, you can hop into a tank or set sail in a warship. However, I always felt the most at home in the air, and hopefully, this guy can help you sprout wings of your own. Hello, this is me in post editing. If you um managed to make this far to the video, I honestly can't thank you dumb enough for sticking around. This project, while made for a class of mine, was also a passion project of the sorts. Of course, I care a lot about the various problems within the game, and I do have certain gripes about certain aspects within it. However, setting aside the amount of money I've given to the snail, I honestly love this game to pieces, and I'm happy that I can share my passion with this game with everyone here. Anyways, as I mentioned earlier, link below is a video about binding your controls in-game as well as a small area in the form of a Google Doc where I discuss various aircraft I've used while recording footage for this video. Um, and uh, other than that, I got nothing else for you guys, so um, 
I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Stay frosty.